Tracy Swedlow, and this is Television Nation. I have a special guest today, and I'm really excited to introduce a gentleman by the name of Howard Blumenthal, who is a senior scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, but he's had a long history in the TV industry, and uh, he is an innovator from the very beginning, child of a TV innovator. I think you're going to really love his story. Welcome to the show, Howard. Thank you. Nice to be here. So I originally reached out to you, of course, because of your background with the extremely early days of Cube TV, which was the first interactive TV project from Warner Cable in Columbus, Ohio, my hometown. And there's so much more to tell, but I uh, want to hear a little bit about you from your perspective. And of course, you are the child of Norm Blumenthal, who was the producer of Concentration, that old game for uh, over you, all those people out there who are probably over... 45, 50, maybe you'll remember that show. So Howard, what's it like being the child of a TV innovator like your dad? So I'm five years old, maybe six years old, and I'm going into a television studio for the first time. And I looked around and went, I want to do this. And that really didn't change. So in those early days, it was color was rare, black and white. <clears throat> it was still very much the way that things were done. Cameras didn't have zoom lenses. They had to turn the turret so they'd have a wide angle, a telephoto and a, and a middle angle lens. Um, so it was really early days. And I have, I have enough of the memory of that as a little kid to have a reference point. Uh, it also happened that dad worked in what was then the RCA building that was filled with television studios and radio studios. And radio was still pretty active for NBC at that point. Do you so, know, do you know if David Sarnoff was around at that time? I don't think he was, but I, I can't know, remember the year he, he died, but anyway, go ahead. So, but, it, but it's, it had, because it was in Rockefeller center and it had been a radio facility and they still talked about Toscanini and all that in, in eight age in the Peacock studio, because it was among the first to, to be color capable. So it was wonderful to be part of that. And then when I got out of college, we're starting to look at television, moving to Los Angeles and uh, narrowing of opportunities. But there was this idea floating around at Warner communications that there could be an interactive television system somewhat mimicking life in uh, in a hotel pay-per-view system in a hotel the new Otani hotel the Otani hotel in um, Japan in yeah and Steve Ross who was then running um, Warner Communications uh, decided this is what was necessary they had the beginning of a cable division not much but it became the work of the cable division in part funded by the larger corporation, which then lost some money because it was not a particularly good year in movies or whatever. So it ended up becoming a cable notion. And I'm not sure that was the healthiest first step. So but wait, but wait, why did they think interactive TV was an important thing to pursue at this point? I think pay-per-view movies. I think that was the that was initially the reason to do it. Didn't uh, Warner Warner wanted to be able to deliver their own movies to yeah. the consumer directly, which is what's happening now, right? Yes, it's in mid nineteen seventies, right? Yeah, D to C. Yeah, mm -hmm. the question is, what else do you do, or do you just do an interactive movie service? And it became clear that you couldn't really do an in home movie service unless you offered other kinds of channels, because consumers at that point really weren't bought into the idea of, of owning a, a, some sort of a movie box in their house. So hmm. this is at the time when people are still a little unsure about connecting a video game to the TV screen that might be dangerous or it might be able to look in on them in some way. So we're in very early days of consumer behavior um, and proof of concept comes in not so much through the local programming that Warner ultimately did, and we hired a lot of people and produced a lot of mediocre local shows, um, myself included as a producer, so I'm, I'll take the criticism as well. But the, the game was really get the cable franchise so that you could put these other channels in, and among those other channels were Nickelodeon, MTV, uh, a movie channel, and the idea of having a, a sort of a pay-per-view kind of a, a concept. It was actually- channels with different genres at the beginning and there was some kind of show as well uh i think i looked it up that was 
what was it called? Um, talent search. That was like, uh, it, it was almost like a, 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 a progenitor of American Idol, where people would vote on, on, on how the people performed. And then if they didn't perform very well, then it, uh, apparently the score dropped below an acceptable level and the performance was stopped. So essentially that is a radio show called Amateur Hour. Uh, I think Ella Fitzgerald actually was one of the people who got her start on, on that show or somebody like that. <laughs> so all of the formats that we did in early days of Cube local programming were all essentially just repurposed shows from the 1950s. Right. Um, it's not why I signed up. It's not why a lot of other people signed up. We wanted to create the future. So I became involved in is it possible to create a 24-7 automated game channel using very early versions of computer graphics? And we were at that point in Columbus, Ohio, and there was a little lab and a professor who we both seem to have a connection to uh, named Chuck Shuri. So we hired Chuck to create some it's of the- my hometown. Just letting you all know, Columbus, Ohio is my hometown. And Chuck Shuri is the father of computer design and graphics. And my mother trained under him many years ago. Anyway. Many years ago. And we were also looking for a way to have it speak. So we went out to Champaign-Urbana uh, because there was the Play-Doh system that would actually be a, a voiced computer. No. I have distinct memories because we took my entire small staff doing that development across Indiana. And it was just an icy snowstorm. And I remember skidding from Columbus, Ohio to Champaign-Urbana that weekend. And then all of us kind of jammed into one tiny hotel room, about five of us. So it was early days. We were figuring out what could and couldn't be done. And those lessons were vital. So I, Warner bought Atari about that time. So I became the point person with Atari trying to figure out, is there a connection between the interactive system that we had built with Pioneer? Uh, mm -hmm. in, they in, built the box, the remote control. The and the, and I helped them with a lot of the interfaces and all that. I was involved with a lot of different pieces in early cube. Um, and what we found was that it was just too early. People didn't have the behaviors yet, but what we were learning became the foundation for, in my case, moving into home video, laser discs, uh, interact, just video games, just all sorts of different adventures through the 80s, because there were relatively few people who could take the television side and the print media side, because that becomes important, um, and gaming and all these other things. And it was just sort of everything sort of played to my sweet spots. So it was tremendous fun. And I, I can't remember all the different companies I worked with in, in so many different areas from educational software to, to VisiCalc. Um, I mean, Visical. so many different pieces of it. We were all trying to figure out what does that screen experience look like? How do you motivate people to become more engaged with digital media in one form or another? So and, what did you learn? What did you learn? Do you think top, top couple of things you learned? Um, junk doesn't work. Um, Short-term hits probably aren't worth the trouble. Um, it's got to be pretty good because the intimacy with the screen being 18 inches away uh, from the screen or closer now um, really requires a rich, compelling, ongoing experience. So there's a conference, they had a reunion this weekend called Dust or Magic. And uh, the conference is all about, well, we're creating a lot of stuff. How much of it is just going to float away in the wind? And what is it that distinguishes some products or some services and makes them magical? And I think a lot of the answer to that is the talented people who happen to touch that product. Um, and I certainly saw tremendous evidence of that. Um, later on, as we're working with MTV, I came back to MTV uh, and, uh, and Nickelodeon a bit for Double Dare. But we, we were trying to create what is an MTV original program. We hadn't, nobody had ever done that before. So the first thing you do is you get together with a group of people who sort of know what they're doing but don't know too much about what they're doing because you want them to experiment. You want them to make mistakes. You want them to try things that might get them fired. You want them to try things where they might not want to put their names on the credits, which was absolutely the story as we were doing remote control. We're all looking at each other. Do we really want to put our name on this? That was and an MTV show. 
script. It was an original MTV show. It was a game show, but it was a deconstructed game show. Everything was funny and silly. Adam Sandler got started on that show, a bunch of other people. And that gave me the confidence in creating fantasy environments for television and deconstructing old formats. So I did a few pilots. I was in business with IT with a production company for ITV for a while. Um, a, a friend of mine from Cube Days, uh, Dorothy and I, uh, put together um, a book about time travel, actually with the, one of the original puppeteers uh, from Nickelodeon. So uh, from Pinwheel in those early days. And we, we imagined what it would be like to have a federal time travel commission, what it would be like to have different kinds of vehicles. Where would you buy your clothes? Would you buy your clothes before you leave for the trip or would you buy your clothes locally in ancient Rome? Do you think this would be a good uh, series or interactive format right now, that book? Absolutely. Absolutely. The book is called The Complete Traveler, and you'll find four copies on the internet. And I don't know if, I mean, it was not a huge seller, but for me and for Dorothy, we then moved on to Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego on PBS. And that really made great use of our, the imaginative skills that we learned in creating a loopy, illogical, highly logical environment. Um, and in that case, it became Surreal almost, yeah. And it won a Peabody. Yep, won a Peabody, won a bunch of Emmys. Um, and uh, PBS had an article written about it the past 50 years in New York Times, and we were number 19 or 20, which is really cool, like of the best stuff. But Barney was like beat us. So let's let's not pretend that we were the very best. We were almost the very best, but there were big purple dinosaur stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, I know. Um, but um, it, we learned so much about trusting our own instincts, about not following the rules, about really dealing directly with the audience. So I had this 10-year-old boy who lived inside my brain for four years, five years, including the year we developed it. Um, and everybody kind of followed that boy. And that was how we created the show. It was an immense amount of work because a lot of it just hadn't been done before. Nobody had done original animation using Macintosh computers. That was craziness. Um, we couldn't digitize the line drawing, so we would have to have them faxed in to the computer because we could use the bits that were in that in the digital fax to be able to create wow. the and then build the animation. So everything we did was sort of build the boat before we could put it in the water. And, you know, when you do that and you do it a bunch of times, and Cube was all about learning those lessons too, not having enough money, but having a lot of people who want to do things and, and make it as cool as possible. So in the case of Carmen Sandiego, it was just this relentless creative push, not to excellence, but to silliness, to really capturing the kids' imagination and along the way, teaching a lot of geography and world cultures and political correctness and, and um, you know, all the different cultural uh, touchstones that now are very mainstream, then there really wasn't any place to research them. There was no internet. I used to love that um, cartoon, which they made into a movie uh, in the last five or, five or so years about the dog and his boy. Um, Oh, P used to Sherman Peabody and Sherman. And because it was very silly and it was uh, completely surreal, but you learned a lot about history and geography at the same time. But um, the movie that they came out with eventually was pretty horrible, but that's yeah. a, a digression. But anyway, go well, ahead. Not so much of a digression because in the early days of Carmen, we very much pointed to that, to Rocky and Bullwinkle, to Animaniacs, I remember in the second year, because they got it right. Now, we were live action with a little bit of animation and a lot of music. How do we get it right? So we actually, I remember beginning, I think, the second season, spending a day looking at Animaniacs cartoons with the writing staff and just sitting there laughing. Now, that's not necessarily the corporate environment that I would have you know, put together later on. But for that situation, that's what we needed. Again, very close to the audience, make use of all available tools, have fun with it push the edges of it, um, make sure you- Actually artists, your TV artists innovating, using technology, using the medium of storytelling, you are artists. Um, I don't know that we would have elevated ourselves that well. I think we were silly people who enjoyed learning stuff. 
I, I, I'm not sure I would elevate it to artists, but thank you. And I'll, 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 I'll pass that along to everybody who worked on Well, the artists show. pursue their own, you know, uh, the things that drive them, the, their ideas. They don't follow the rules. They, they pursue things that entertain them, make them laugh, make them, you know, feel like they're revealing themselves. I, I, well, okay. So what did you learn from all of that? And how do you think um, people are um, able to, like, what would you tell people today about those kinds of shows? Why aren't we seeing those kinds of shows today? And what would you tell them if you, if you? Um, you need scarcity. You need a gap in the marketplace. So at that point, PBS had to figure out who they were going to be. They commissioned Ken Burns to do Civil War, us, and a ring cycle. Clearly, the ring cycle was a little bit on the, you know, okay, let's continue the 1980s. But the Ken Burns stuff, although he had done things before, here comes Civil War. So now this is a groundbreaking difference in what public media could be and what public television could be. Very exciting. But this is also the era of Beekman's World. It's the era of Pee Wee's Playhouse, roughly. Um, Everybody was sort of, gee, this is the next generation, not the 1960s version of children's television, but something different from that. And we all have a bit of a sort of a, a, a skewed sense of humor about what was done before, but there's also a real um, passion for the way we learned and how important television was in the way we were learning. And we wanted to create that with some excitement and energy in live action because live action gives you so many different possibilities that animation does not. And animation gives you a lot of possibilities that live action doesn't. Um, so we knew this would be a last gasp of live action. We knew that the combination of l music and big audience, uh, 200 kids in the audience all screaming while we were trying to make decisions um, and a game show and comedy and animation and all these different things, all the things the kids asked us to put in the show when we were out asking them what, what they wanted, we gave them what they wanted. Um, I think all of that together was just a particular era in the first half of the 1990s. And then things began to change. Nickelodeon ran with it. Disney ran with it a little bit. BBC ran with it. Um, there was a, a, the Ministry of Curious Things I actually spotted in the early 2000s. And it was every bit as silly. I just watching the show, I just in my hotel room. And there's a man abster, answering a phone, but the phone is a lobster. It's like, yeah, that's my kind. I'm, I'm there. Um, so it continues, but not with the energy, not with the enthusiasm. It became more of a business. It became more, uh, you know, less flexible, less fluid. And, um, and it grew up. And I did too. Well, I mean, maybe there's a gap in the market today. There's a need in the market for some silliness like you're suggesting, because I know, I mean, Netflix is definitely um, putting out children's programming that's interactive, but it's very much based on the choose your own adventure model. And you were doing something much more comprehensive with, you know, all sorts of resources and uh, layers, right? And uh, interactivity with the kids and sending stuff out. I mean, um, that's more of the transmedia model, which uh, was also a sort of trend that's come and gone where you're, you're, you're providing all kinds of input into the storytelling experience. Um, are, we, are we too old to embrace that model again? I mean, it may be that it's that all of it, it that has lost its center. Think about it that way. So post Carmen for me, I, Carmen became at the, in the later years for me, an exercise in brand building for kids. Just, I really was just sort of passionate about how do you build brands in the right way that, that are productive, that can positively impact the education world. And then gradually I drifted into music industry and other aspects of branding and became a senior executive for a few big media companies. So I was very much the perpetrator of sort of how we developed internet brands and all that. I was pretty involved in that. And then there was sort of a hard stop in around 2000 where I said, you know what? I don't know if this is the best use of my talents or best use of my abilities. And I wrote a book called Branded for Life that really took a critical look at how we use brands to simplify, to shortcut. So JFK, Martin Luther King, we know so little about those people. We know these little glimpses we know the I have the dream speech, but most people can't 
talk to you about exactly who will now we know a little bit more about Christopher Columbus, who for a long time was a brand as well. And I started thinking about, well, if you were to add context and texture and, and all of that, what would that mean? And that led me towards, well, how do we learn? How do we acquire knowledge? And how important are beliefs in that? And how important is, um, uh, and how important are facts? And this was sort of before the whole fake news thing, which I don't necessarily plug into as much as everybody else does. My interest was, how do we begin to develop, develop understanding in the 21st century with all of these resources that are available? And how do we take all that and turn it into something even more powerful than what we did with Cube or MTV or, uh, or Carmen Sandiego? Because now we have that opportunity. And the answer, as I'm writing every day and thinking about this every day, looks more to me like individual learning than collective experiences. It looks to me like what you're interested in and what I'm interested in, well, they overlap, we're having a conversation, but the way I spend the rest of my day may not be on the same curriculum as the way you spend the rest of your day, because we have resources, we have options, we're each individuals, and it's really been impressed upon all of us that we are unique and special. So if that's true, and I'll buy into that, sure, I'm unique and I'm special, and so are you, and so is everybody else, you can't teach them all the same thing. So when I watch this terrible distance learning notion where you point a camera at a teacher and then she talks or he talks to, um, you know, to 20 people, it's like, oh, you know, there was a time when we, when we were silly. There was a time when we were colorful and musical and all that. That's what we need in order to be able to have people learn from screen, through screens. It has to be a much more compelling experience because you're competing against television and a zillion YouTube pieces and all the video games that you know you can imagine and all that. So there is an opportunity to take much of what we've learned and put it into the K through 12 education space and the numbers support it because you're looking at arguably 1.7 billion kids who are currently enrolled in school between five and 18 years old. So I've been devoting a lot of my time as a senior scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, but but primarily um, looking at it through the lens of asking individual kids all over the world, what's your life about now? Where do you want to be going? Exactly the same kinds of questions that I asked early on with Carmen. I want to get into their heads so we can do the right things and be helpful and have some fun doing it. So when that ended, I started interviewing adults uh, about what school ought to be for a series called Reinventing School. But I'm kind of on that same track of I want to know how to take all these tools and all this imagination and all these spectacular creative people and get them closer to the magic than to the dust. Does it need to be entertainment or does it need to be um, an educational class that they're taking that's told in a sort of silly, colorful, surrealistic way? I don't know that I see a difference. I don't know that I make the distinction between education and, uh, and entertainment anymore. So we've been watching, uh, we just discovered it's a series on BritBox called Vera. They're hour and a half long mysteries. They happen in Northumberland in England or someplace close to the Scottish border. And I get so much from the context of how the people interact and how they speak and how they relate to the very wide open landscape and what situations they end up in as a result. And this series is not new, um, but it's not all that old. And just the quality of the acting. So is that learning? I, they've created a fantasy environment. They've completely drawn me into the stories. Um, I think it's pretty good. Now, jump over from there to the British baking show which I am convinced is the most successful television property ever created on planet earth. <laughs> I certainly watch it. We watch it as a family every Friday night now. Yeah. I mean, it's, and you can go back, you know, how many different, ep you know, how many different seasons and you have your favorites of, well, well, is Mary Berry better than Prue? And, you know, and I'm having these discussions with three-year-olds, but I'm also having those discussions with people in their nineties. So in terms of demographics, it is probably the best television series ever created, but it's also wonderfully educational. 
because not only am I learning how to bake and I'm watching all these people get through their struggles and overcome obstacles and deal with social emo emotional issues and all that, but I'm not sure that, you know, and I eat pretty good, but I, I'm not sure that half the the things that are on there are familiar to me. And then by the way, here's a way to actually make them. I mean, what a spectacular way to have people learn. And when I talk to kids, a lot of them actually want to cook. They want to bake. They're really interested in it. So should we do that instead of teaching um, British history? I think you're getting British history as a result of doing this. I think it's changed. I think the definition of education and entertainment and imagination and knowledge and understanding and beliefs, I think it's all really in one pool now. And the better we are at helping people to learn on their own and then pulling it together in ways that are meaningful, I think that's where we go. And I think screens have something to do with that, but I think it really comes down to the individual student and how they prefer to learn. So again, I have this bad habit of actually listening to the people who I want to serve. I'll go out and talk to a thousand individual kids because I think it's really important to do that. And anybody who's developing anything in children's media who doesn't do that, maybe those numbers are a little extreme, um, is missing the opportunity, but also is missing the fun of it. Well, I know uh, PBS, you know, used to, or I still does, uh, you know, provide a whole educational layer to their programs. But I, I'm not quite sure that they um, are as successful as they'd like, perhaps. I don't really know much about it. Do you know uh, whether that has been a good course for them or not, or if they're or doing more or less of that? There's a lot of formative testing, formative testing. There's a lot of summative testing. There's a lot of before testing and after testing. Producers are very tied into what that research says. Very few, I don't think any PBS children's programs are produced without having a researcher deeply involved in the content and what the characters look like and all that. And that's noble, but it also creates a, a sort of a really productive battleground because you want to go back and forth. And we ran into that on Carmen as well. It's like, well, how far can we push it and still be okay? And, you know, this is not, some of it touches on censorship. A lot of it is really well-intentioned, but if you have people who aren't fighting it out, it ends up flattening it out. It just isn't as interesting to watch. So you want the energy, the collaboration, the conflict, all of that is really healthy. And it's not, it's really healthy, not just in children's media, it's really healthy across the board in any interactive, in any form of education, in any form of learning. If we both agree, it's not interesting. It's the places where we disagree a bit, where we disagree a lot, where I'm trying to make a connection over to here, but you're trying to make a connection over there where you're building a wall and I want to build a bridge. Um, all of that is fascinating, uh, you know, as with, it's not in English. All right. So we're going to have to have it in multiple languages. Is that a problem or is that an opportunity? I think it's an opportunity. So well, what if the translation is not quite as good as it is perfect as it should be? Well, do it and it'll get better as opposed to let's make sure that it's perfect and then we don't do it at all because we can't afford it. It's just, we've, we've sophisticated this to a point where we just aren't having the fun that we should be having. And the kids sense that. It's a really interesting observation. Um, are, are, any other, are there any other shows that you see out there that are touching or on something that there's a glimmer of hope for? I think there's a lot of hope, but I think it comes in, um, you know, watching... Anything Aaron Sorkin does, for example, to, to shift away, he's listening in a different way than a lot of people listen. And I think that's wonderful. I think the moments when today is election day, the moments when we watch that election coverage and somebody goes off script, somebody goes further away from the key concept, that's where the fun is. And I'll go back to producing game shows for that. The really interesting part about producing a game show is never when the contestants are following the rules and doing it. It's always when something unexpected happens. So my father, great lesson, the concentration. So concentration was a game of matching squares, similar to the card game, but there was a rebus puzzle behind each of the squares, 30 squares that got revealed. And it was based on 30 small motors that 
would click to one face or another. Well, those motors were electric motors and occasionally they would heat up. And on one episode, some smoke started pouring out of the board. Now, I think that that was live. I forget exactly whether it was live or early days of videotaping those shows. And uh, my father very wisely in the control room did not call a commercial break. He just told the host to deal with it. So because he knew that having the host live trying to stretch for two or three minutes would be much better television. Yeah, they'll fix the board. It'll work out. But you don't get magic to land on you so often, right? So um, the guy was a pretty good singer and dancer and tap danced a bit. <laughs> he just did anything he could to keep the audience engaged. It worked out beautifully. And then they went to commercial and they fixed the board. Nowadays, I think we would have edited that out. I mean, it seems like, you know, in many ways, you know, you're touching on the sort of magic of live programming, right? And of course, we've seen many examples of live programming when it was incredibly exciting, like the old, you know, uh, theater programs in the 50s uh, and or 60s. But now, as much as uh, these networks experiment with live streaming, they always turn back to pre-recorded. And I'm just wondering if there isn't some kind of opportunity here to explore a network that might only be live streaming, might be collaborative, might be interactive. Maybe that's what's missing here because people are live streaming all day on Zoom, but you know, it's not doing anything for them because it's not entertaining, because it's not funny. Uh, I'm just sort of thinking out loud. My favorite conference calls are when somebody's dog w walks in, right? That's a much oh, yeah. thing conversation, right? And all of a sudden the dog is in their lap and now we're talking about dogs and it becomes normal. It becomes, you know, as, as much magic as there was in walking into an empty television studio when I was five years old and looking at how they would build the set and all that and creating a magical environment that had enough impact on me that I've been trying to create magical environments for a lot of years since then. There's something about the authenticity of my sitting down with a kid who's seven years old in Bulgaria, not being able to speak her language. She can't speak my language. And yet we can't stop giggling. We're just having fun communicating back and forth. And I've now there are probably 800, maybe more short videos from these half hour interviews that I did in, in Kentucky and, and India and, and uh, Sweden, all over the world. Um, and the parts that I like best are always the parts where either I'll get caught off guard and I'm behind the camera or the kid will get off guard and we just riff. It's just live. It just feels good. And I will never say, Lyle, let's take that again. That's that, that was like, we had too much fun. Like, I'm not sure what having too much fun is. I think the point of it, and the audience really feels this is when you have a connection, when you are able to just loosen up, we're all going to learn something. It's going to be fine, but there's going to be bumps along the way. And I think humanizing and, and, making this feel like a natural experience is and then staying within the structure of oh good and let's make a giant wonderful crazy television show but having those moments and having the audience know that they're in the game with you i think is how is the differentiator too much structure mm, you know and then there's you know um, you know the very successful very scripted shows so everything I'm saying is wrong, but that's okay. Um, well, what are you doing now, uh, in short, at the University of Pennsylvania as a senior scholar? Are you following up with these interviews? Are you putting it together in some kind of big report? What's going on? Will yeah. we ever see those clips? Yep, they're all available. They've been available for a few years now. Okay. Uh, just go to www.kidsonearth.org and that'll take you to this library of about 800, but about 800 videos. Um, but what the kids have taught me is the cool part because they basically told me this is the story of human progress in the 21st century. This is what's important to us. This is how we perceive the utter inability of adults to solve problems, climate change among them, uh, pandemic among them. We have a sense of the contours of what our lives will be. We're not as grateful as we could be for the mess that the adults have left us in. Uh, we have a very real need for very powerful individualized education. We're not going to be able to work with your 20th century models. So look at Greta Thunberg. Look at 
um, the kids after a shooting. Look at the attention that they're trying to get. That's the next frontier. That's the part that interests me most right now is how can I, with the experience that I've had and maybe some unique insights, how can I help them get there? How can I be a different kind of adult and, um, and open the way? And so I'm writing now quite a bit about what school could be, not should be, but could be if we eliminated curriculum, homework, and testing. And just let kids learn on their own within a structure. And the structure begins not with science or English, but with my body and my mind and my community and the miracles of exploration and discovery. So I'm really spending a lot of time thinking through, well, all right, learned a lot, had a lot of fun. How do I pass some of this on in a way that other people can use it? Because somebody handed me a box of magic at some point, and I, I feel like it's my responsibility to keep distributing it. All right, well, words of wisdom. Hopefully you will be able to spread the pixie dust out there. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your life and uh, what is inspiring you for the future and, and for giving us uh, so many um, opportunities with the potential for interactive television. Hopefully we'll be able to make good on that um, in you know exciting ways going forward. Thanks so much, Howard. Thanks for creating a forum where we can talk about this. Really appreciate it. Howard Blumenthal is Senior Scholar at the University of Pennsylvania, and you can also find him on, uh, on the internet, and you can buy his book on Amazon, the, the, the time travel book he mentioned. I'll provide a link. And that's it. My name's Tracy Swedlow, and we cover all sorts of topics, whether it's the industry and OTT and addressable advertising and you know technology and measurement, but we also are interested in how television gets created and who were the creators and are the creators. Thank you so much. Sure. This is Television Nation. Thanks, Howard.